Welcome back to another adventure into sound and space. In this project I'm revisiting a few older techniques, mainly the use of electromagnetic feedback as an asset in the compositional process, as well as a slight departure from the usually rigid structural organization of electronic components. As always, the music used throughout this video is generated either by this or previous works. Creating a title is often about finding a combination of words that succinctly describe the conceptual basis of the piece in question. This piece is called Auburn Scour, uh, where Auburn refers to the reddish-brown color of the copper, uh, the material that is used to create a coil that is wrapped around a loudspeaker. This coil picks up the fluctuations in the magnetic field of the driver and feeds it back into the audio path while scour comes from the abrading sound that is created by this process, almost as if the audio is dragged through a pipe lined with steel wool and coarse sandpaper. The music is for the most part created by an algorithm written on the daisy seed and consists of two rhythmical and four harmonic voices. This algorithm revolves around a set of rhythmic and melodic sequencers that evolve over time by gradually and randomly swapping values in their respective arrays. The backdrop comprises four sawtooth oscillators that use the same strummed chord generator that I used in my previous project, shamelessly implemented in this work as well with some minor alterations. It uses notes from the melodic sequencer of the main rhythmical voice as a basis for intervallic generation of chords in close relation to the harmonic root of the melody. The patterns of the two rhythmical voices are also reflected in two separate colors through a series of LEDs mounted to the inside wall of a speaker enclosure. Their role is essentially to light the edges of a row of acrylic plates which act as light guide plates where the patterns of the two voices may or may not overlap depending on the data contained within their respective rhythmic arrays. One of the challenges that comes with making one-offs or bespoke objects like these is that uh, the finished product is very often the prototype as well, uh, meaning that there is no uh, iterative improvement that is made over successive generations of the same product. So when you are designing in your CAD software of choice, you have to keep in mind the order of operations or the order in which the parts are being assembled as well. And if you end up with a part that is particularly impractical to work with, then uh, more often than not, you have to look for solutions to find a way to work with what you have rather than to make it again. This was also particularly evident while mounting the loudspeaker, but I'm a bit ahead of schedule in terms of where we are in the video for that, so we'll have to get back to that in a few minutes. The bottom line is that the interior of the enclosure was extremely congested and somehow I vastly underestimated how much space the wires would occupy. Anyway, the biggest challenge during the design phase was to figure out how to mount the LEDs. Since the enclosure was 180 mm long with an internal diameter of 76 mm, there was no way I would get my hands in there to utilize any fine motor skills beyond holding things in place. Ideally, the entire internal circuitry would be mounted to one single object doubling as a backplate, capable of sliding in and out of the enclosure, but due to the commitment to previous design choices and the placement of mounting points, this turned out to be quite impossible. So instead, the solution was to make four internal LED mounts with threaded inserts to be screwed in from the outside. This was also impractical for compartmentalizing the LEDs into bigger chunks for ease of soldering while providing some strain relief for the wires. And again, due to spatial constraints, I was unable to include line output connectors, which certainly made recording the background music for this video a little bit more difficult than usual. But the redeeming factor is that there wouldn't be much use for a direct output for silent listening anyway, as the electromagnetic feedback requires sound from the speaker in order to function as intended, and the amount of feedback in the signal is proportional with the overall volume of the sculpture. Thank you. 
As for the electronics, I decided to take a slightly different route than I normally do. But before we get into the details, we need to do some uh, bookkeeping. The sculpture is powered by a 15 volt DC external power supply with three internal switching regulators providing 5 volts and plus and minus 12 volts. The DC and LEDs run on 5 volts while the audio amplifier uses the full 15 volts. The op amp is the only component drawing power from the 12 volt regulators, essentially a 50 cent part running off a 10 euro power regulation circuit. For the past couple of years I've been adhering to a quite strict set of rules when it comes to freeform electronics, which I call the scaffolding system. I've talked about it in a couple of my previous videos, but here's a recap anyway. In the scaffolding system, the circuit is modularized into subgroups organized by function, or their specific role within the electronic ecosystem, with the neatly laid out power and signal buses that are easy to plan and document. This allows for a very predictable and streamlined soldering process, which is beneficial when working with large analog circuits. But in this project, most of the audio, besides the electromagnetic feedback, is entirely digital and produced by the DC seed, leaving very little discrete circuitry to work with in terms of freeform electronics. So instead, I decided to take a more organic approach and forego the bus lines entirely. The circuit in question is responsible for amplifying the signal from the copper coil, with some biasing and clamping to ensure that the signal stays within the absolute maximum ratings of the DC, which is plus and minus 1.8 volts on the audio input pins for those interested in that. This would be the only visible circuitry of the entire sculpture, with the microcontroller and voltage regulators all situated within the enclosure. And because it is the only electronics visible, I made a decision to treat it more as a detail rather than as a major determining factor in the overall aesthetic of the piece. Finding the right balance between traditional materials such as acrylic glass and sometimes aluminium, and the use of electronics as a structural element has been a central concern over the past four or five years. I suppose this stems from a desire to develop my own distinct interpretation of the characteristically idiosyncratic aesthetic of electronic components within an increasingly saturated field of new media art. Since I don't have a background in design or visual arts, I've concluded, at least in the context of my own work, that relying too much on the more traditional materials to carry the aesthetic load, as it were, can be quite detrimental to the perceived visual quality of a piece. I think, as mentioned in previous videos, that this is where the functionalist quality of electronics can come to the rescue if the balance is right. This is the point in the video where I normally ramble on about the philosophical underlying ideas of the piece I'm presenting, but uh, in this case I've um, I got nothing. So instead I'm gonna ramble on about uh, washers for the next couple of minutes and then uh, call it quits. As I mentioned previously, I had some issues while mounting the speaker. My go-to solution for fastening loudspeakers is to use machine screws with the prevailing torque nuts, in this case uh, nylock nuts, which have a nylon insert that grips the threads and prevents the screw from backing off. But since I had underestimated the sheer amount of stuff that would be occupying the speaker enclosure, aligning the nuts with the screws from the back without being able to see what I was doing was quite a bit of a challenge, and it took me about half an hour to get all four joints tightened. The simpler solution would have been to heat set threaded inserts directly in the plastic, but then the challenge becomes keeping the screws from loosening over time. Several factors can contribute to a screw coming loose, including vibration, thermal expansion, material creep or relaxation, and of course insufficient torque. In a scenario where you have a threaded insert in plastic, using any sort of thread locker is off the table as the fumes from the adhesive will crack and craze the material, leading to a whole set of new problems beyond just a loose bolt. 
So the only practical solution besides proper torque is to use some sort of conical washer that maintains preload even if the screw loosens slightly. Some people seem to have strong opinions against these washers, but my view is that uh, as the material relaxes and joint tension drops, a conical washer can compensate by acting as a spring between the screw head and the material, at least in theory. I'm not a mechanical engineer, so these are of course just my uneducated thoughts based on the observations I've made so far. I might very well be overcomplicating things too. My 3D printer, which is largely held together by regular nuts and bolts in PETG, is exposed to a lot more vibration than my sculptures, and I can't remember having had to retighten a single screw during the three or four years I've had it. So again, since there is no deeper philosophical meaning behind this project, I'm <clears throat> quite literally out of things to talk about, so I'll leave it there, and apologies for the somewhat truncated video. For those who would be interested in seeing the code and schematics for this piece, they should be up on the higher tiers of my Patreon, so find the link in the description for that. Otherwise, thank you for your time, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you.